too sexy for my love. Love's going to leave. Ready? It's early morning, but I want to see everybody come on, stand up, and let's clap a little bit. A little energy in the room. You know, it's tough to do the early morning lecture, so I had to do something to make it a little fun, and we're talking about sex, right? <laughs> I'm so glad to see such a full room this morning, so many people who want to talk about sex. Awesome. I got somebody doing jumping jacks out there. Awesome. Woo! I love to get some energy going in the room. This is great. All right, guys. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you, everybody, for playing. <laughs> love to get a little energy going. So. Female sexual dysfunction, they haven't really talked about that much on these stages, so I'm really excited to get a chance to talk to you guys about it today. But I want to tell you, just like Andy said, mine is going to be pretty rapid fire too. I've got a lot more slides probably than we can actually get to in a, in a really detailed way, but I wanted you to at least have the slides because I know you all have that to take home. So if I can, oh, I have a clicker somewhere, right? <laughs> All right, so let's see. All right, so clinical case studies. So I talk a lot clinically, and the reason is I did the fellowship a long time ago. I'm an advanced fellow, done lots of fellowship modules, and I love the fellowship, and I think it's the greatest training you can get in functional medicine, integrative medicine. But one of the things that I find a lot as chief medical officer of Bodylogic MD, I have doctors who come to me for training, and they are, a lot of them, through a few modules of the fellowship, or they've taken the first five modules, and they've got a lot of great information, awesome biochemistry, we understand the background of why we should be doing what we should be doing and what the evidence looks like, but a lot of people don't feel like they really have the tools that they need Monday morning in the office when they see patients to really understand what to, what to actually do, what to put in practice. So I hope today to give you some clinical pearls. We're going to go over some of the causes of female sexual dysfunction, and we're going to talk about some case studies and how I've been able to help some women in my practice over the years. So I am an OBGYN. That was my original training, board certified in OBGYN. But it was, this whole sexual dysfunction thing was pretty personal to me, actually. A little bit embarrassing to talk about, but personally, and, and I tell you this because I think it's important that you know why I'm so passionate about this subject. When I was 28 years old, I found myself having absolutely no sex drive. And that's not supposed to happen at 28 years old, especially when you've only been married a couple of years. And it was devastating to me, but I think even more devastating was the fact that I was actually an OBGYN resident at the time. And I actually had no idea at all how to help myself. How many people in the room are OBGYNs? Oh, we've got a lot of you, good, great. So how many of you think you received really good training on how to help a woman with low libido? That's what I figured, no hands go up. How many of you wish you had that kind of training? Yeah, exactly, because how many of you see tons of patients in your practice, even if you're not OBGYNs, how many people see patients out there, women who complain of low libido? Yes, the entire room, right. So unfortunately, in conventional medicine, we really just don't receive a lot of training. So that sort of sent me on a 15-year mission to try to figure out for myself and for my patients how to treat this problem. And there are good answers out there. There really are. And I'm, I've been honored to be able to help hundreds of women and by training other doctors like you, thousands of women. So thank you very much for being here and being excited about helping women with low libido. So sexual dysfunction, the human response, sexual response cycle, everybody knows the Masters and Johnson's model, right? It's pretty linear. We have the excitement, plateau, orgasm, resolution. And how many people, is this the model that everybody pretty much knows? Show of hands? Yeah? Okay, good. And how many people, how many people feel like this is, this is exactly right on the way it works for males? Raise your hands if you think so. No, nobody thinks that's the way it works for men? Come on, you guys. We got up and got the blood flow going so you could raise your hand a little bit. I know you're in better shape than that. All right, so I think most people think that this is the way it goes for males. And how many of us think this is the way it goes for females? Show of hands. Okay, so a fair amount of people think so. 
This is actually, and, and this is, this was actually brought forward by Rosemary Bassan. This is the, the newer version of the female re sexual response cycle. And this really seems to be a lot more on target with the way women experience sexuality. So instead of that, that, that model that goes just from the, the desire to the arousal to the excitement orgasm plateau, women as men, the men in the room will probably tell you, we are a lot more complicated. <laughs> so we have a lot more inputs into the thing. And it's also, it's not just this, this curve that type of thing, but it's a, it's a cycle. And women can enter the cycle anywhere in the cycle. So a lot of women, the, the female response cycle, it's, it's nice that that's what she called it because what they've really talked about is the fact that women tend to be more responsive. You know, I find a lot of my patients and a lot of, I see a lot of couples now because I do see men in my practice too, and I find there are a lot of couples who come in and they're concerned about the fact that the woman doesn't automatically right away feel like this, you know, she's not sitting around just going, oh my, I, I'm ready, <laughs> you know, and people get frustrated with that. But women's sexual response tends to be Actually, once you get past what I call the phase of urge to merge, you know, when you're in your young 20s, having sex is like a biological imperative, right? That's what we're all here for. We're all here to reproduce, procreate. And so it's like a, it's like a drive. It's like sleep. It's like eating sex, right? But once we get into our 30s, the hormones start to drop, everything that starts to happen with age, it becomes more of a responsive thing for a lot of women. And a lot of women are, are, are frustrated by that or or maybe just have unrealistic expectations. So what you, what you really need to teach women to do is to figure out how to, how to evoke a response, basically, and how to, or how to get their partner to evoke that response. And a big part of that is the emotional intimacy, right? For a show of hands in the, in the, in the room for women, if you're, if you're not too embarrassed, if you're, if you're pissed off at your partner, how likely is it that he's gonna get some that night? <laughs> All right, nobody raised their hand. Exactly. That's the bottom line. When we're angry, when women don't feel close to you, we don't, we don't want to have sex. But the really hard part of that is men, how do they feel close? They want to have sex, right? That's what increases the intimacy. So you wind up with these couples in these negative cycles, but they really need to kind of meet each other and realize that, the, that it's just so different for men and women. And that's this Bassan model. So that's sort of some of the things, the highlights up there of what we just went through. One of the other things that it said on that last slide that I just want to make that point is that with women, you know, men are very goal oriented, you know, football, soccer, <laughs> but for us, it's not as goal oriented. It doesn't necessarily have to end in orgasm for a woman to have a sexually satisfying experience. And I know I'm not telling any ladies in the room anything they don't know. And I know there are a lot of educated men here as well who might not, who I'm sure know that. But at the same time, something that I think is really important to bring out in a lecture about this. So the reasons for sexual dysfunction in female patients, or FSD as we call female sexual dysfunction, so there's decreased libido, right? That can be hormone issues, that can be stress issues, and a lot of other issues that we're gonna go through as well. Dyspareunia, so that's pain with sex that a lot of us gynecologists deal with. And the most common thing that people think about is atrophy, but another one that I really wanna bring to the fore is vaginismus. So sometimes you give a woman all the estrogen, vaginal estrogen and every trick in the book that you can think of and she still has painful sex. Well, one of the things that you might want to try to differentiate from when you're doing their history is does she have painful sex that's right at the introitus or, you know, is the, and does she still have dryness and things like that? Or is her pain deeper? Because when you think about it, the vagina is made of all muscle, right? It's all muscle all the way around. So women get this, when they go through, especially when they have a long period of atrophy causing dyspareunia, they wind up having this involuntary contraction of all the vaginal muscles. And then basically, even if you fix their atrophy, you haven't fixed their vaginismus, this involuntary contraction of muscles. So the minute she sees anything coming at her, she's involuntarily contracting. And you have to get a lot of those women through that by recommending things like vaginal dilators and, and to go really slow and easy, but also explaining it to them that this is, this is a muscular thing. And then, of course, as you tense a muscle more and more, what happens to it? It gets sore, 
right? So then any time she has, experiences penetration, she's going to feel that, that discomfort because she's not able to relax her muscles. So there's a lot more going on there than just atrophy. There's vulvodynia. There's all kinds of things that we can talk about. Not today because we don't have so much time. Um, and of course, there's relationship issues. Re relationship issues and emotional factors, depression, anxiety, things like that.